Good afternoon, everyone. Um, there should be plenty of space here. The room has a capacity of 200. <coughs> so this is uh, Computer Science 1 or CS46A. Uh, let me show you how you can get to the course information. You Google my name. Uh, you'll notice that your instructor has a Google number of 1. Um, over here it says my San Jose State course page. And here, by the way, it has my office hours. And there's the link to the course page. And another click gets you there. All of this is being recorded. And I'll put up the video on YouTube if it was too fast for you to catch this. <coughs> so today, we're just going to go over how the course is going to run, the mechanics, and all of that. Um, it's a fairly complex course. And <coughs> um, you're going to have a lab um, either on Friday or next Tuesday. Um, and so you must attend that. Um, you need to bring your laptop to the lab and all that. Let's go over those rules here one at a time. So, <clears throat> like I said, it's the first course in computer science. Um, there's, uh, I've given you the link for green sheet and so on. You're gonna be learning to program in Java. Some of you may already have some programming background um, some of you, may be the very first time that you do any programming, that's fine. There's no particular requirement. Um, if you've had uh, a programming course in high school, for example, you'll find that it helps you a little bit to get started, um, but uh, around week three or week four, where we're going to be doing a lot more with objects and classes, most students find that this is pretty new material to them, <coughs> even with, with some uh, background. So we're all going to be on a pretty even footing in a, in a few weeks. Uh, you're going to be learning not just how to program, but also some fundamental concepts in computer science, um, <coughs> things that have to do with um, how one thinks like a computer scientist, how one designs algorithms, how one designs programs. And also, there's a good amount of emphasis on good software engineering habits. So programming, uh, in this class, you're going to be writing programs that are maybe 30 lines long, maybe 40 lines long. But real programs, as you know, have millions of lines. And to manage those much larger programs, one needs to have good habits and you know, know about you know, what scales. And so we're going to be uh, instilling some of those, uh, those in you. So in that regard, it's a little bit different than a course programming in Java, which would just focus on the Java language and on writing small programs in it. It's if, meant to be uh, the, f the first of many courses that ultimately <coughs> lead to the, uh, uh, to the bachelor's degree. Um, it's, uh, the course is suitable for someone who just wants to learn how to program in Java. Um, but it, that's not the uh, primary focus. So <clears throat> uh, we're hoping that all of you will get a degree in computer science, will get a good job in computer science, and will send lots of money back to the department so that we can educate <laughs> the next generation. So, <clears throat> um, and that's a good question, of why, why computer science? Uh, when, uh, a few years ago, um, the beginning class was pretty sparsely populated. That was just after the dot-com industry had gone bust, and lots of people said, oh, computer science is probably going to be you know, not, a, not a really good field to go in. Instead, I'll go into finance. And so I guess now there's plenty of people here, so maybe finance hasn't worked out so well. Um, <coughs> and there actually are lots and lots of jobs in computer science. So it's a, 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 it's a practical reason to go into computer science, because it really does pay the bills and it's likely to do that for some amount of time. So here you have some boring links to some, some articles that say it's, it's a good job that pays the bills. Um, <clears throat> as a job, it also has the enviable characteristic that most software engineers um, as, or computer scientists know much more about what they're doing than their managers, and it means that the managers have limited control over them. And so if you know what you're doing, you can, uh, you, you tend to have <coughs> a lot of freedom in your job. There's in fact only one job that ranks higher in this department, and that is a university professor. Having done both, um, I can attest to the fact that both of them are interesting jobs. Um, but the other thing that makes me uh, get up in the morning and fire up uh, the <coughs> uh, development environment is that it's a lot of fun. It's a creative activity. And one wants to create new things. And as a computer scientist, you can create new things because you're learning these tools where you can build things that didn't exist yesterday that make your life easier, that make someone else's life easier or safer or better. 
And, <coughs> um, and it's not uh, something that if you develop a car, that must be kind of a tedious thing to do because you, know, you have a good idea. And that six years later, the first car rolls down the assembly line and you can see whether the idea actually worked out. But in programming, it's different. You try something new, and within minutes or hours, you get positive feedback that now you've just made something a little bit better. And <coughs> you do that again and again, and so it, it makes the day go by pretty nicely. And then when you have built something, it's always amazing to me when I've built something and I see other people use it. <coughs> of course, I have no idea how this was built, but I've seen them use it, and I see them enjoy it and be delighted. And <clears throat> that's always something that, that, that really makes it fun to do it again. And so that's not something that everyone can say. So I, I think it's a, it's a worthwhile career to embark in. And so if you're kind of wondering whether it makes sense to spend the, the time to learn it, you know, <coughs> uh, I think it does. So um, a boring slide on what computer scientists do. Um, the, the basic idea is that many computer scientists become computer engineers and uh, program for a living somewhere. But that's not the only thing that you can do. There's many people who have a degree in computer science and who do all sorts of other stuff. Um, so it is a useful degree that leads to careers in pretty much whatever field uh, you might be interested in later. All right, what are we going to do in the next uh, few months? We're going to be learning about the fundamental programming concepts that underlie uh, really all programming languages, variables, functions, classes, arrays, inheritance. <coughs> and you'll learn what these words mean. We're going to be doing a lot of programming with Java um, for pragmatic reasons. It's a good beginner's language, and it also carries you quite a bit um, into the curriculum. So <coughs> you don't have to change languages all the time. You're going to learn how to design algorithms and programs, how to think like a computer scientist. You're going to learn how to plan, test, and debug. And you're going to be surprised, negatively, I'm sorry, that that planning, testing, and debugging takes a lot of time. It often takes more time than it does to do the actual implementation. Um, you're going to learn how to learn. Uh, computer science is, is a complex subject, and it changes all the time. It changes very, very quickly. And the, it's, it's different to learn about it than it would be to learn, say, introduction to psychology, where there you would learn a lot of facts, um, but you don't really have to apply those facts all the, uh, as, as intensely as in computer science. Computer science, the number of facts that you learn is, is kind of small, but you have to learn a lot of strategies, and you have, to, you have to constantly apply what you're doing, and you constantly get feedback of whether you're doing it right, or I'm sorry to say more likely that you're doing it wrong, and uh, <coughs> so hopefully that feedback will encourage you to, to learn more and to know that eventually it works out. <coughs> so I'd like to say again, no prior knowledge of computer science or of programming is required. I assume that you know you you have a laptop, you know how to turn it on and that kind of stuff, and we'll take it from there. Um, <coughs> so, ultimately, what any instructor wants to do, and what I certainly want to do in this class, is I want to change your brain. You're paying me money so that your brain is different and better at the end of the semester than it is now. And it turns out that changing one's brain is not as simple as, as it seems. One has to do more than just listen. Listen is actually quite bad. If you want to make your brain so that its chemistry remembers things for a long time, there are four steps that are involved. <coughs> the first step is, of course, some kind of a concrete experience, such as listening or reading. But that step by itself is not enough. Because your brain has been exquisitely designed over millions of years to throw away almost all of the information that it receives. Because, of course, you receive much too much information. Most of it is not essential for survival. You have an instructor honking or something here. Not essential for survival. A saber-toothed tiger has just entered the room. More essential. So your brain knows how to filter these things out. And most of the stuff that I tell you is immediately discarded unless I somehow get you to think about it. So if I get you to think about something, then it gets moved into short-term memory. And so the, the chemistry of your brain changes a little bit. The next thing that <coughs> you have to do is, after you think about it, you have to form in your brain a 
plan of action of what you're going to do next. And you have to do it. If I tell you what to do next, it's useless. You have to do it. So I have to get you to do it. And so you have to come up with some plan of action. And then for the information to move into long-term memory, you have to execute that plan of action with your body. You have to do something with some part of your body. Otherwise, the information will not move into long-term memory. That might just mean typing, or it might mean writing. That's one reason, by the way, why note-taking is an effective strategy. Because you have to think about what notes are you taking, and you have to get your hands to, uh, to execute that action. The act of note-taking helps you to move stuff into long-term memory. You could throw those notes out into the uh, trash can on the way out. It would work just as well. In fact, I have never ever in my entire life looked at a note that I've taken during class. And <coughs> I'm sure m the same is true for many of you. But you have to write them yourself and you have to plan ahead. Simply copying someone else's notes mindlessly doesn't work. Photocopying doesn't work. But writing them amazingly works. And that's just how we're wired. Our brain has to go through these cycles to move the information to where it's held in long-term memory. And we can't really change that because it's very difficult for us to change the way that our brain works, right? It's been given to us in this way. And we can engineer our computers, but not ourselves. So <coughs> there's this whole theory of active learning, that you need to do a lot of stuff in order to, to learn these, uh, th these things. And you might wonder, why doesn't my psychology instructor do all of this kind of stuff that I'm going to make you do? And the big reason is, or for that matter, why doesn't my calculus instructor force me to do all of the things that I'm going to be forcing you to do during this class? And the big reason for that is your psychology instructor or your calculus instructor doesn't give a care what happens to you next semester because you will be done with psychology or with calculus. You're not a major in those fields, but you're a major in our field. We greatly care what you learn in this semester because we need you to know it next semester. The next semester we care because we need you to know both of those things the semester after. And so we're expanding a fair amount of stuff and making you do a boatload of work so that you retain this while you stay in our program. <clears throat> so we want you to graduate in our program and you really need, do need to know all of this. Everyone who's out there as a software engineer, as a computer scientist, knows the kind of stuff that you're gonna be learning for the first semester. So, <clears throat> Um, I said listening is actually not a very effective way of, uh, of learning and certainly listening over 75 minutes is a pretty dreadful way of trying to absorb any information. So why are you here in this lecture hall? And I've often asked myself that very question. I write these, uh, these textbooks. I wrote the textbook that we're going to be using in this class and why should I tell you something that you could be reading in a perfectly nicely written textbook? And so there's no glory in me telling you badly, was written much better in the book. So I'm going to make you read the book before class. Did I mention it's an excellent book? So you're going to read the book before class. There's a quiz, a very short quiz of, with 10 questions before every class, except today. There will be a quiz on, uh, that's due on Sunday night. And the quiz is about the material. Um, some students s try to skip the reading part and go straight to the quiz. And I've cleverly designed all of these quizzes to contain all of the unfamiliar terms so that it drives you back to the book and then you get to read it. And that's fine with me. Go ahead and try to take the quiz. And if you can make it through the quiz, you're probably ready for the class. In class, I will not tell you again what you have read because you have read it and you've answered a quiz about it. I will be glad to answer questions if anyone has questions about the material because maybe in your opinion the book wasn't quite as good as it was made out to be then I'll be glad to explain it as best as I can. You can email me. I'll tell you later how you're going to get those questions to me. And so that's usually what ha what's happens at the beginning of the class. There's a bunch of questions that have accumulated, and I'll take care of those. And then I will lecture about those parts that, are, that I know to be difficult. And I'll give some rules of thumb that are maybe a little bit too vague to be published in a book. And I'll give you some tips and tricks that, that are of that category. I'll run through some examples. So I'll be showing you some of the things on how you need to do them <coughs> when you need to write your programs at home. And there'll be some kind of exercises during all of those lectures. I might ask some questions. I might give you a little bit of code and say, complete it, where you would have to fill in a line of code or two yourself. 
I might uh, give you some steps of an algorithm and say, you need to figure out, right in class, what is the next step? And then there'll be a mechanism where you upload that and where then we jointly review uh, what everyone did and whether people are on top of it or not. So that means you need to bring your laptop to every class. So starting on Monday, every one of you needs to bring a laptop with sufficient battery power to last uh, 75 minutes. Um, during the exams, you'll also need to bring your laptop. And at that point, you need to bring your laptop and a power cord for obvious reasons. And so we'll be snaking the power cords from the two outlets. And someone will be standing outside watching out for the fire marshal and alert him <coughs> if that person were to come. Um, <coughs> there's this lecture, which is every Monday and Wednesday. Um, and attendance is mandatory. I'll know whether you attend the lecture or not because I'll be asking questions during the lecture and you're gonna be uploading those answers and I'll know who, who uploads what so uh, I don't even have to take attendance, I'll, I'll simply know. Um, you'll get a point for every answer that you give and hopefully that'll motivate you to attend the lectures. The labs are also mandatory and they're fairly long. They're two hours and uh, 45 minutes. Um, you need to register for a lab and uh, in order to register for the class and I'm sure all of you have because I've looked at the number of lab registrations and they add up to the number of lecture registrations. Um, you must take the lab. Yeah? Um, sorry, totally derailing, but um, you know, Yeah, I'll get to that. Okay. I, 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 I think I know your question, but let me get to that and then, then, then if uh, I didn't cover it, let me know. Um, so um, you must show up at the lab with a laptop. The first lab is this Friday or next Tuesday. So be sure to be there with the laptop. And there's some software that needs to be installed. Homework Zero, which is due on Thursday night, um, tells you what software you need to install so that you'll be ready for that on Friday uh, or Tuesday, whatever the, uh, <coughs> the case may be. And you will fail the class if you fail the lab. Even though the lab is itself a small component of the grade, you must be present. Uh, we, we spend a fair amount of money on these labs and we think they're good for you. And uh, so you simply, you simply must be there. So make sure that you have that kind of time. Now there's lots of homework in the class and that's probably what people remember most uh, years later. That the amount of homework that you have in a programming class is so much more than that what you get in a lot of other classes. And the reason is that really the only way you learn this stuff is by doing it. Um, there <coughs> people have tried to teach people programming by having them bubble in answers and multiple choice questions. And somehow it just doesn't, it, it really doesn't. So you're gonna have to do the homework and you have to do it. It's very easy to take a piece of homework from your buddy and copy it and turn it in. And you're not learning very much from that. Fortunately, it's also very easy for me to run a piece of software that finds out who copied what. And I will do that after the first couple of assignments. And I will publish the results for all to see. <laughs> you have been warned. So, <clears throat> um, like I said, it's a ch challenging course. So what are some of those challenges that, that we find? Um, and I'm, I'm serious, it is the most challenging course that we offer in the department. We have a higher failure rate, it's 46A than we have in any other course. So our hardest graduate course is easier to teach than this course. So when I teach a graduate course, it's a piece of cake for me, it's a piece of cake for the students, but this course is really hard for everyone, for me, for you. And <coughs> uh, so why is that? Prerequisites actually are not the problem. You know, if you're well overqualified to enter this course. You can read, you can do basic arithmetic, that's really all you need. You don't need calculus. Aptitude. Um, the lady on the left here um, is, uh, this is a painting that's a couple hundred years old. Um, if you had been in that stratum of society 200 years ago as a woman, you would have been expected to play the piano tolerably well. And it turns out everyone can be trained to uh, play the piano tolerably well as long as they put in the time. So it, it was not just a question that maybe some people could play the piano like it is today, but everyone in good society 
who was a woman, could play the piano well enough to entertain uh, a party uh, for, for a couple of hours. So everyone can do it. The same is true with programming. Everyone can learn this stuff. The question is, do you want to? The lady there was presumably motivated one way or another to spend the thousands of hours that it takes to learn the piano tolerably well. And if you're motivated to put in all of that time, I can teach you how to program better than she can play the piano. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and yes, computer science is interesting, and it's creative, and it's fun, but it also does, I'm sorry to say, have its tedious aspects. I would imagine just like playing the piano, which unfortunately I can't do, but I see my daughters you know, spending hours doing what seems like a tedious activity and practicing scales. Um, they're motivated, fortunately. Um, not sure I would be, but so I can understand that, you know, for some people they might say, this is just not for me, or I've just never done anything like that, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. And so it's, it's, it's better to know that you might have these challenges in, in the beginning, and so that's why I'm mentioning it. Now the biggest issue is time. You simply have to have the time to put in to learn it. You're not going to learn the piano by reading the textbook, right? You have to actually play the darn thing. And the same thing is true for programming a computer. It is a time-consuming activity to, so, so that those things that need to become automatic, that they actually are automatic. And so students uh, often marvel at you know, how a professional can program things quickly because so many keystrokes, so many activities have become completely and utterly automatic. And that does take some amount of time. And so you have to have the time set in there. And <coughs> study habits. Um, in psychology, I, I have nothing against psychology, but uh, <laughs> I am told that most people study for a, an exam in psychology the night before the exam, cram all the information into their head, reproduce it during the exam, and then they release the information again from their brain. And that's not a winning strategy in computer science because your, your brain needs time to learn these more complex things. It's not just facts. It's uh, strategies and uh, <coughs> practices, and it takes some time to learn it. The other thing is you are bound to make stupid mistakes. Uh, everyone does. I do. And if you only have four hours for all your stupid mistakes, that's not enough to get the help to fix them. Whereas if you spread your work over several days, it works fine. And so these study habits are tough for people who've never had this kind of thing. So we, you know, we always worry, why is it so hard to do this? And I would say, nothing has prepared most of the people in a classroom like this for what they're about to do. Nothing in the American high school system has prepared them for this. There are very few courses like that. So piano is really the closest analogy that I can think of. So what do you have to do? You have to come to class every single me class meeting. I promise the lectures will start getting interesting on Monday. You have to come to every single lab meeting. You have to do the assigned reading before class. So I won't lecture on the stuff that you can read, like I said. For the programming assignments, um, you will submit two versions of each programming assignment, a draft and a final version. And the reason for that is that it used to be that we would only collect a single uh, version, and it was due, say, on Monday night, and then people on Monday morning would start asking the first question about it because they never even bothered to look at it before. Well, the draft forces you to look at it. So, and it works amazingly well. So the day after the draft, I get an enormous volume of questions. And then we have several days to beat all those questions down so that everyone can complete the assignment uh, su successfully. And that's really what we're after. Um, <coughs> it's, this is a four unit class and so it turns out that when you look at the government formula for units, um, that means you're supposed to be spending 12 hours per week on this class. Two and a half hours for the lectures, two and a half hours in the lab, and seven hours outside class for preparation and homework. That's an enormous amount of time. Typically, when one asks students, how much time do you spend on your average class? They say, outside class. They say four hours, and when one actually measures it, it's about an hour and change. So seven hours is a huge amount of time that you need to be able to set aside. That would make it very difficult if you are a full-time student and also hold down a job. People can do it, but it is a lot of time to juggle. 
<coughs> and so you really need to look at your schedule and make sure that you have that kind of time. The next thing is when you're stuck and you will be stuck, ask questions. One of the biggest things that I'm going to teach you this semester is to ask good questions. It's a much more important skill than programming. And it's one that people are surprisingly <coughs> uh, unused to. There's going to be an online discussion group. Um, you already got the invitation to this thing called Piazza. Accept the invitation. Um, those of you who are going to be adding late, um, you're going to get that invitation as well. And uh, Piazza is, uh, is really quite amazing. And I just read through the student evaluations from last time, and students were pretty mixed about how I was doing, but everyone loved Piazza. Um, so what, what it is, it's the system where you have a question, you put in your question, and then other students uh, answer. And last semester, the average time from question to answer was 10 minutes. And so most students got most of their problems answered right away. And I log in every few hours, um, sometimes more often than that. And sometimes I'll just endorse the student's answer. Sometimes I'll put in my own answer. But it's, uh, that system had thousands and thousands of questions and answers in there by the end. And it, it was an incredibly useful resource for everyone. So when you have a question, your first instinct should be to, to put that question onto Piazza. People will say, well, I have a homework question. And here I'm putting out the code from my homework onto Piazza for everyone to see. Wouldn't I be giving away the answer? Well, let me tell you, if it worked, you would, but then you wouldn't have the question, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're giving, if, you give, if students have a whole bunch of non-working code, you know, that's not giving away the answer. They would even have to choose which of that to pick. And God forbid they might read some code. And they might learn something from that. So don't worry about putting anything at all on Piazza. Um, if, you know, if you do by accident put in a complete solution, I'll quietly tell you not to do that again. But uh, it, has never <laughs> it has never happened in the several semesters that I've used it, that a student put in code on Piazza where I said, I've got to take that back. It gave away the answer. Never once. Thousands of, uh, of questions and answers have never happened. So don't be shy about it. Answer your peers' questions. You'll get a better grade. You get a point for every question that you ask. You get a point for every answer that you give. It doesn't have to be a good question. It doesn't have to be the right answer. You get a point simply for participating. Yes, sir? Is that extra credit or just a certain That's a part of the course grade. Okay. Yes. So on the flip side is if you, if you silently you know, just, just lurk and never do anything, you'll get no points. Yeah, that would have been a good question. Would I give you a point right on Piazza? Is that also your dinner No, no. <laughs> That's a r random thing from the internet. All right, homework. Homework's due before every class meeting, every t Sunday and Tuesday, 6 p.m. Um, some people say it's really unfair to have the homework due on Sunday. Sunday is yeah, the uh, day of rest. For those people, homework is due on Saturday. <laughs> Um, homework is due at 6 p.m. and I really mean it is due on 6 p.m. After 6 p.m. I will stop answering questions about the homework on Piazza. So I will not say anything. The only, diff the only thing is people say, I've tried to submit it and the Dropbox is down. Then I might try it. Um, the Dropbox is actually open until 11.59 p.m. And the reason is, you know, with some people their computer dies at 5.58. And that gives them enough time to, you know, re resurrect it drive to the next internet cafe, and upload their work there. Don't rely on this. I've had people saying, well, I was horseman now whether I'm really uh, at the internet cafe or back at home. I work till 11.59. But then if at 11.59 it shuts off, um, that's your problem and not mine. No mercy after midnight. Homework zero is due this Thursday. Homework zero is very simply make a snapshot of the uh, of this installed software as, so that I know you've done it and uh, so that you're ready for the lab on Friday. The assignment is in the system called Canvas. You've gotten a login for it, um, and there should be a drop Dropbox there already. All right, we talked about draft and final. Lab, um, <coughs> you must register for the lab. Um, you must attend to pass, um, and you must, there's 15 lab sessions. You must attend 12 of them, um, or you will automatically fail. And if you fail the lab, you fail the course. So don't do that. You must be there. It's not a distance learning kind of thing. Uh, it's structured in such a way you're working with a buddy. 
Um, there's an, there's an instructor who's there to dispense tips and wisdom, and uh, so you really must physically be there. Um, the reason that you work with a buddy is that it often turns out that when you work with someone else uh, that you can struggle through a problem that neither of you would be able to do themselves. And I don't know that from programming, but I know that from an activity that I detest, namely home improvement, I can never do anything in home improvement. But if my dad and I work together on something, we get fed up at different stages of the process. And so when he gets fed up, I say, oh, let's just try this. And when I get fed up, he says, let's try that. And it usually does carry us through something that neither of us would be willing or able to do by ourselves. And it's oftentimes the same thing with the lab. So the buddy stuff works. Um, you're going to be assigned a, a, a partner. Um, the lab instructor is going to make an effort to pair up people with similar skill levels. Because I mean, it's pretty frustrating if one person like knows everything and the other one knows nothing. Neither of them really is in a, in a great situation that way. At first, it's going to be kind of random, but over time, the lab instructor is going to watch you and swap out partners. Um, the one negative, the, the single biggest negative that I got from last semester's student evaluation is that some people felt strongly that they did not like their lab partner, and of course, that does happen. Um, in that situation, you can send a confidential email to your lab instructor who will assign you a different buddy. Yes? Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work because the labs are in rooms with finite capacity, much smaller rooms than this one. And I believe they will all be completely full. Yeah? I'm on the wait list for not this class. You're on the wait list for a lab. Yes, and that might, um, we'll have to figure out how to do that um, because you know, if your schedule is so that you can only go into one lab. Okay, we'll, we'll have to figure it out. Yes, I, I do realize that, that, that the lab's schedule is a, is a sticky thing, but the labs are in finite rooms. I had to look at the rooms, and there's no way to squeeze more people into them. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it, hopefully. All right, so when you, when you work in the lab, one of you writes code, one of you writes, writes words, the, the answers to the questions that are there. Um, the coder submits the code, the, the scribe submits the words in the lab report, and each uh, week you switch roles so that another person gets the chance to, uh, to, to do the actual hacking and uh, the other one does the scribing. Um, to make sure that people do switch the roles, the points are different. You get four points for one activity and two for the other, and that way if you don't switch, you won't pass the class. Um, all right. Questions? Um, it's one thing that, that really amazes people when they take this course for the first time, that how many ways there are to be stuck. It's uh, like in, in psychology, it's kind of rare that you're stuck, I would imagine. You just you know, flip through the book until, I have nothing against psychology. Um, in, in calculus, people are often stuck because they say, I don't even know where to begin. And that's, of course, you know, a big problem in computer science, too. But in uh, in computer science, one is often stuck with silly things. That's something that you know should work. The computer tells you it's not working. And it just says it's not working. Or it might give you like a complicated error message. And now I would like to be able to tell you that after you have your bachelor's degree in computer science, you will not be stuck again. But I would be wrong. And as evidenced, I have a couple of links here. Let's see. How this person says, how do I write the equivalent of T extent? Whatever. Let's see who that person is. Um, it is a potentially familiar person. Um, and so here is an answer. And this answer was actually pretty nice by a fellow who is smarter than I ever will be. Um, and then, you know, I ask again. And so you see there's, you know, there's a dialogue where eventually, oh, this other person is also these are all very smart people. And they helped me out. And eventually, if you read through it, I, uh, I figured it out. Uh, it was a, a more difficult question than the one that you would ask. But these people who would definitely have other things to do than to help me, they helped me out. This happens every day of the year in computer science, that there's this informal network of people helping each other. Now, why do these people help me? They don't help me because they think I'll ever be able to help them they know that they are much smarter than I am. 
they help me because they know that then I will help the riffraff that they don't even want to begin to deal with. And I do. You know, I try to pay back and they help me, so I try to help some, someone else who I can help. And so this is an informal thing that goes on in computer science that people do try to help each other. We're all in the same boat kind of dealing with these just tedious, nagging issues, thousands and thousands of them, where someone has the answer and you just need to get at someone who has the answer. I have no idea how we functioned before the internet. And I guess we didn't function all that well. Um, because I remember that it would take me days sometimes to work on some, some problem and the answer was something really silly and, and, and trivial. And nowadays I just you know, go to the right forum, I put in the question, and sometimes after minutes, sometimes after hours, I, I get the answer or I get something that makes me think about it. And also actually sometimes good things happen that I write my question and as I write my question and formulate it so that someone else can understand it, I say, duh. And I don't even have to post it. And so that's good when that happens, but it doesn't always happen. Most of the time I do end up having to write the question. And so sometimes I, um, let's see what this one here was. Um, if, if you read through one, one of them, you'll see a tone of distinct condescension by one of the people who answered this. And so now the entire world knows, if they go to this particular website, that Horseman is an idiot. That's just life. So at some point, one has to realize you can't know everything, and it is better to get an answer than for the world not to know that one is an idiot. And, but it is a fear that lots of people say. They say, I don't want to put any question on the website, because then everyone else knows how stupid I am. Get over it. We're all stupid. And you have to learn to overcome that. It's a difficult thing for a lot of people. Um, and after a couple of weeks, you will see so many idiotic questions that you will say, gosh, I may be stupid, but these people are stupider than I am. <laughs> and at that point, go ahead and put on your stupid question, and 10 minutes later, you'll have your answer, and you'll be getting over it. And really do it. It's, it is an incredibly useful thing to do, and it's an incredibly important thing to do. Asking questions helps you learn. Answering other people's questions helps you learn. And it helps you do the things in the span of a week that otherwise might take you, you know, a month. So really do it. The textbook. Um, read the textbook before every class meeting. Bring the textbook to class and bring it to the labs. I know the thing is, is hard to schlep. Get the electronic version if you don't want to schlep it. But there will be times when I say, Open your textbook to this page and do something with the material in there. I mean, there's a reason you pay it, whatever it is. I mean, too much money for this. So when should you buy the book? You should have the book by Monday. So uh, you really do. If for whatever reason, you can't you know, get someone who, who has it and share it with them. You need the current edition, not the last edition, not the edition from, from six years ago. So just, just get that and you really will need it. Um, you will have to read the book and that will make sure to have activities where you actually have to look up something with it. All right, now what everyone wants to know. Adding to the class. Yes? That's correct, I need to change the image. So this, this book will work, um, but the book that, that's in the syllabus is the Java Concepts book. And the Java Concepts book has, it's the first 14 chapters of this book. So yeah, sorry about that. Um, if you put a question, if you put a thing on Piazza, I will change it and you get a point. Because yeah, there's, there's millions of details at the beginning of the semester and I can't remember them all. Um, it's the sixth edition of Java Concepts or the fourth edition of Big Java. And the syllabus has the ISBN. But if you wanted to get the electronic one, uh, it's a different ISBN. And if you put a question on Piazza, I will find out what that ISBN is. Yeah? Big Java 4th Edition is, you, you can use it for the, for the course. Big Java 4th Edition is the same thing as Java Concept 6th Edition. So if you, if you have one, so I should put both pictures on here. What's that? Is it on the syllabus? I don't know. 
Um, if it's not, put a question on Piazza. You, you earn a point, and I will, I will add it to wherever. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, the E edition is, is perfectly useful. It's a, I, I think, I don't know how they, how they package it um, as, as a locked PDF or some such thing. Uh, but you can install it on your laptop, and then you have it. Oh, and uh, I should mention exams. I, I don't have that anyway. Exams are, I really don't. Exams are open laptop. You bring your laptop to the exams. You can bring your textbook to the exams. So the bad thing is you don't get any points for memorizing anything. But the good thing is that you don't have to memorize anything. So uh, the E edition is actually useful for that because you can search. Yeah. Uh, how, the, how are the exams formatted in HTML? Oh. <laughs> no, <laughs> what you, oh, the, what the, what you, the activities that you have to do in the exam are typically fill in some extra code and something that almost that runs mostly. Um, it might say trace through this code and tell me what it does, and you would have to fill out a table where it show, uh, where you have to sh show how the variables change. For example, it might say find the bug in this code and correct it. So they, they, uh, the exams probe the kinds of tasks that we want you to learn. And there will not be a single question about a definition. Because you, you're on the internet during the exam. <laughs> so you could you know, try to Google the answer. If you found it, I would have failed in designing the exam. <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, and they're good exams because they, they really uh, probe what it is that we want you to know. And, but they are a bit intense. There's no question about it. OK, adding. So those of you who want to add, uh, copy and paste this form here into an email message. Send me the email message. Fill out the form. I need to know your name, student ID. Are you an open university student? Are you, are you repeating the class? Um, are you already invited to Canvas or Piazza? I just want to know so that I don't send you a double invitation. And then most importantly, I need you to check all the lab sections that you are able to attend. Because for some reason, uh, when I send you a permission code, they no longer enforce the capacity of the labs. You could theoretically add yourself to any old lab, and that could cause some of the labs to overflow. And then there would be more people in the lab than the room can hold, and it would just not work. And so what we're going to be doing is I will tell you what lab you must enroll, and I will later check. And if someone tries to cheat, then I will instruct to drop them. So don't do that. Um, so send me that email, and I will be able to take care of a whole bunch of them as soon as the next lab section opens. They're going to open another lab section on Tuesday, and that should enable me to add you know, about 30 people. Yes. There's going to be two labs on Tuesday. That might solve your problem. That would be good. Yes. Um, if you're flexible with the labs, if you can take the Tuesday lab in particular, that's Tuesday 1700 to 1945, the chances are excellent. It does not look to me that there are more than 150 people sitting here, and we, we are able to accommodate with all the labs 150 people. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I, I would say give it a try, and you should know very, I will know very quickly. <clears throat> uh, what the situation is. And I can put a, a thing on Piazza. You can add yourself, well, I can add you to Piazza and I can add you to Canvas even though you're not registered, which is why I'm using those systems instead of the dreadful desire to learn. Um, and <clears throat> um, so you should participate because there's a very good chance that you will get in and you will need those lab grades and you will need the quiz grades and so on. Um, to, in order to, to get a good grade in the class. So be sure to, as soon as you send me the email that says you want to add, to participate in everything. And if for whatever reason it looks like we're vastly oversubscribed, I will see if we want to add another lab section or I will let people know on, on Piazza that we have a problem. Where do you find the where, where do you find what? All right, so you need to, to repeat the steps that I did at the beginning. Go to Google, search for Kai Horstman. Um, the first hit will be my homepage. Go to the San Jose State homepage, my San Jose State homepage from there. Go to the course page, and then go to lecture one. 
You could also just copy that URL. The whole process has been cleverly designed so that people who can't figure this stuff out can add. All right. So things to do today. Um, yeah. Send me the ad email if, if you need to add. Log into Canvas and Piazza so that you know what they are. Upload a photo of yourself. I know there's 150 of you and I won't be able to remember any of your names, but some, sometimes I do and I, it helps if I have your photo. And then uh, you know, if there's an issue, so then I can say, oh, that was that person. Read the instructions for homework zero today and you know, do them by Thursday. Look at quiz one so that you see what you're supposed to do. Um, I believe, I hope there's a way for you to look at the quiz without actually taking it. Um, if for some reason there's no way to look at the quiz without actually taking it, let me know in Piazza and I will publish the quiz this month. Yeah? When you add, I will take your email, put it into the Piazza thing now, and you will get an invite. Okay. The same with Canvas. Okay. So with everyone who sends me that email, whether or not I'm able to accommodate them or not, I will invite you. So you can part start participating in anticipation of eventually getting added in. So there'll be no situation where you won't have access to the information. Everyone uh, will have access to it. You know, if for some reason it doesn't work, then send me another email. Yeah. Get the textbook, get a laptop, and start installing the software. Some of the software is tricky to install. There's this piece of software called Alice that is notoriously difficult to install. It would be a good idea to get that started before the lab, uh, well before the lab, so that when there are problems, you can ask questions on Piazza. And that's all I've got. So, any questions here? Uh, yes? Um, the question was, when do I expect the, the email uh, the, with the ad request? Well, I expect I'm going to get a whole bunch of them in 15 minutes, but I mean, you can do it whenever you want. I'll just process them in the order in which they are sent to me. Well, um, a whole bunch of you will know the result right away, and I will put out a notice on Piazza tonight or tomorrow morning explaining on where we are at with how many people are still on the waiting list so that you can gauge your chances. Yes, can we have a couple more minutes of silence while I answer these questions? Thank you. Um, this unfortunate fellow has Windows 7 32 bits. Let's have a moment of silence to commiserate. <laughs> So yeah, it'll work fine. You can use Windows, uh, Windows 7, Win Windows XP, um, Windows 8 for all I care, Linux, any flavor of Linux, Mac OS, uh, 